All right, well, good morning, everyone. Thank you guys for joining us for LPC Coffee and Collaboration. We are really excited today to talk about dealing with difficult people. Um, say what you want, but I think we all have experienced a difficult colleague, a difficult boss, a difficult client, or we may be the difficult one ourselves at times. And so today we're going to have two um, experts in our industry, Cliff Becker, um, Farm Journal Media Vice President, um, Publishing Director for the Livestock Side, and Holly Martin, um, the High Plains Midwest Ag Journal Publisher here, to share a little bit of their experience and how they navigate dealing with difficult people and difficult situations. And so I am sure that you will all have a lot of great questions to ask them. So please, if this is your first time joining us for an LPC Coffee and Collaboration, I just want to let you know that down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a little bit of a chat bubble. Um, if you click on that, it'll pop open the conversation tab on the side there. And please go ahead and type in any questions that you may have throughout the chat, and we'll make sure that we get those asked when they're done with their presentation today. Um, if you have any troubles with audio or are having any difficulties, we have um, one of our experts here on campus with us that can help troubleshoot with you over there in that conversation tab. Um, and again, thank you so much for joining us. This is being recorded, so we'll be able to share this with you guys on, on social media and YouTube as well when the chat is over. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Holly and Cliff to introduce yourselves a little bit and get us started. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Cliff Becker with Farm Journal Media, as Jen said. It's a pleasure to be with you all this morning on behalf of Jennifer, Holly, and myself. Welcome aboard. Uh, both Holly and I asked ourselves why we were picked uh, for this particular <laughs> coffee and collaboration meeting, and uh, we both decided, as probably Jen said on the preface here, uh, that some of these difficulties can lie within ourselves. And I think that's probably why Holly and I are on these calls. So uh, I hope it resonates. I hope it resonates well. Just uh, as kind of a precursor here, uh, we've got some slides. And we want to bring some outline to the discussion. But uh, really, both Holly and I would like this to be your discussion. So we've left a lot of time open for uh, questions, for giving us examples on some scenarios that you're either facing right now or you've faced in the past or you might think about in the future, and we'd be glad to uh, try to give some of our input uh, to see if we can't bring some direction or solutions behind those as well. Uh, but realistically, uh, you know, as, as Jennifer said, we're all sitting in a scenario where our jobs dictate the fact that uh, relationships and business relationships, personal relationships, all come into the job environment. It's our job uh, to understand those, uh, to bring solutions to those, no matter how difficult it can be. Uh, we're going to touch on a few things this morning. We're going to touch on employee relationships. We're going to touch on peers and how those affect one another. Uh, we're also going to talk about bosses and how those things happen against each other, and then about clients and how those three scenarios are different. There's different applications to each, and we'll try to bring as much relevance uh, as we can uh, to solutions to bring to those to help you guys through those uh, situations. But uh, just to kind of get things started, obviously, difficult people come in all shapes and all sizes. Uh, they can be our coworkers, they can be our boss, they can be our customers. Uh, but the fact of the matter is there's no real solution, to, there's no single solution to every single scenario. Uh, this is where your expertise, this is where uh, the longevity in the business, handling different scenarios certainly comes in handy. Uh, I've been doing this for 35 years. Holly's much younger than I am. Uh, but both of us have had quite a bit of experience trying to uh, navigate through some of these waters under all three of the scenarios that we're going to try to cover with you uh, this morning. But uh, one of the things that, that both Holly and I talked about coming into this is really the biggest tool that helps you get through any one of these scenarios is listening. And it's it's being a good person on the other side of that phone or on the other side of that desk to where you really try to understand what the scenario is up front, uh, learn about exactly what type of things go into the scenario in which you're trying to deal with, and listen. So if we carry that kind of throughout the rest of the uh, program this morning, uh, if, if you can get that and kind of keep that in the back of your mind, I think most of these scenarios will come a little bit easier than you think they will. Uh, but what we're going to do first, Holly and I decided that maybe something just kind of to get your juices flowing at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, is to give you three different scenarios just kind of to think through 
uh, jot down a couple of notes on these each right now. And what we'd really like to do is kind of get your input up front on how you would handle some of these scenarios. And then at the end of the conference, uh, when we try to give a few primers or some examples on how maybe through or how you could uh, wind yourself through some of these scenarios, see if your answers are the same at the end as they were at the beginning. So the first scenario is you're asked to work on a collaborative project with a coworker with whom you don't see eye to eye. How would you make the best of this situation? So what are the things that you would bring to this conversation, whether it's back to your boss to say, hey, you know, this guy and I don't get along very well. I don't know how I'm going to manage myself through the scenario. Or what type of elements can you bring into the project and put to use to where you can make that a win-win scenario for both you and the coworker with, the, with which you don't see eye to eye. So that's the first one. Write that one down and start to put some thoughts behind it as we go through the rest of the exercises. Number two. This comes back to your boss relationship. Uh, your well, this is yours, Howie. I think, isn't it? Well, yeah. I, I, I just that's fine. You can do it, or I can do it. But yeah, your boss overloads you with tasks that aren't in your work description, and you you feel overwhelmed and you feel um, like it's really not my job. And so, how do you do? What do you do in that situation um, so that you don't eventually become his? slave doing all of his work for them or something like that, you know, so that it doesn't lead you down the wrong path. And then the third scenario is, um, go ahead, Cliff, you can do that part. So the third scenario goes back to the customers, your client base. So in this one, your client sends you the wrong ad, but blames you for the mistake. Uh, it turns out that actually the mistake is falling on the client, but how do we tack tactfully tell the client that this was their mistake. Um, again, in these scenarios, you've got to go back and uh, try to make the best of it and try to bring your best foot forward while still being tactfully with your answer. So how would you deal with scenario number three? And as I said, we'll come back to these at the end of the conference to see if there are things that uh, you might handle differently after we kind of navigate through through some of those. Uh, but the first one we're going to talk about is the employee coworker relationship. I, I believe Holly's going to kind of walk us sure. through that outline. Yeah, and we we I just go ahead went ahead and put up some of these the topics of things that you might need to think through as you as you as you get started. And and as Cliff said, I think the common thread through all three of these different types of scenarios is to listen. And most often are are you know when you get into a difficult situation, your common your common response is to want to immediately react. And I think that possibly if each one of us take a step back and pause and, and do the listening, it, it certainly sets it off on the right, on the right foot. Um, and, and, you know, I think the other thing that through all of these scenarios as well, when you, I, I, I read it, read something one time when people talked about, you know, relationships are like money in a bank, like money in a jar. And as you work with somebody, as you continue to um, work in a positive way and do the things that you say that you're you're going to do, you, you fill that jar up. And so then when there becomes a conflict, when there's something that actually um, – becomes a problem, it starts taking money out of that bank. And if you immediately deal with it and immediately have some of that money stored up in the bank, you're, you're a lot better off. One of the, I think there's some of my co, <coughs> excuse me, some of my coworkers listening in and, and I know that they can agree to this, that oftentimes I'm just like on a mission and I just want to, I'm like a bull in a china closet, and so I just want to go right in and, and deal with whatever it is that's happening. And, um, I, you know, one of the things I've been learning over the last last few years is that you can't, you, you don't always do that. You need to establish a connection. You need to make sure that um, you ask them, hey, how was your kid's football game this weekend? And I know that seems kind of silly, but when you establish that good relationship with them, Having that done already before the difficult situation happens, um, it certainly it gives you some more money in the bank. Um, <clears throat> so start start with that sort of scenario, regardless of where you 
of each one of these these um, different relationships. When you're work, dealing with a um, difficult employee and coworker, um, giving clear feedback is important, particularly if <coughs> if it is a subordinate. You um, you need to make sure that you're telling them exactly what they've done well <coughs> and how you would want to do it differently going forward. Um, if you if it is a subordinate, you need to document the information and even and even. Actually, you know, if it's just a coworker, writing things down sometimes help, helps you think about it and think it, think it through and um, helps you maybe self-evaluate what you could have done differently going forward. Um, you want to be consistent. There's nothing worse than working, um, working with somebody who's erratic and you don't know what their response is going to be. You don't know how they are going to react to certain situations. And so being consistent is, of course, very important. <coughs> when you're their boss, um, I, I, you know, you always want to follow through with the consequences and work through the processes in your, in your organization. Um, that's pretty straightforward and, and is something that you always want to do. Um, and then don't poison the well. And what I mean by that is it is important that when you – sometimes it's so frustrating and you need to vent, and you should always do that, I feel like, but you need to vent with someone that is removed from the situation. Don't complain to a coworker about another coworker. All it does is it stirs the pot and makes things – it can make the situation even worse. Um, and then, consequently, then by venting, hopefully you can manage your own thoughts so that you aren't automatically, you know, you're starting each situation with a clean slate and are able to approach it with a fresh, fresh um, set of eyes. And then I, the last thing is be courageous, and that sort of refers to if you are the are the boss, um, there are times that um, you have to make the difficult to situation to, for example, let someone go. And, um, you know, the, when you get into those situations, what you have to do is think about not necessarily about what you're doing to the employee that is, is going to be let go for a variety of reasons, whatever those might be, but, the, but think about what kind of better situation you're creating for the, the, your coworkers. And um, you know it. You know if you're if you're letting someone go because they aren't aren't doing their job or they're falling down, all that is doing is making it more difficult for their coworkers. So by letting that person go, what you're doing is creating a better work environment, and that helps you be to to take that little be create courageous step a little bit further. Okay, next slide, Jennifer. Um, Can I jump in here real quick, Holly? Yeah, go ahead. Just on a couple things. Uh, plus, mm -hmm. we'll give you a chance to. I know. Take your water. Drink of water. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> As you can tell, poor Holly's fighting a hell of a cold, mm. so uh, uh, she's going to be a difficult host today. Uh, <laughs> one thing I think that's important when we look at these kind of employee coworker scenarios, two things, uh, and you guys have all heard this before, I'm sure, but uh, I've been a salesperson my whole career, and I always love talking to kind of younger folks in our business at NABA and things, and they say, oh, I, I could never go into sales, or I'm not a salesperson. Well, first of all, everybody's a salesperson. You may not be directly involved with selling your product, uh, but you're selling yourself every single solitary moment when your feet hit the floor. Uh, so selling yourself in all these scenarios becomes very, very important. And really, on the other end of that, I heard a lot of people that say, well, I'm not in management. I don't manage anyone. Uh, the same goes through as for being a salesperson. Everybody's a manager. You know, number one, again, we're managing ourselves. Uh, so we have to understand what our role is, what dimensions or boundaries we have within the roles that we play. But we've also got to manage those who we work with. And it's got to be managed in a way to where you're, you're kind of uh, holding up your end of the rope, and, uh, but you also have to challenge and motivate and ensure that they're holding up their end of the rope. So you're managing both sides of that relationship all the time as well. And for kind of both ends of that, again, whether you're managing people directly uh, or you're not, uh, I think there's also something where we, you've got to see that there's a real difference between sympathy and empathy. Um, when you come into some of these scenarios, as, as Holly said, some of them are difficult. 
Uh, some of them take a little bit more time, attention, and uh, soothing than others. And there's some scenarios where your sympathy has to come out. Uh, and sympathy truly says that you're saddened, uh, that you truly understand and you're kind of on their side of this deal. And, and it's more of an emotional type position, which is very, very, uh, a very strong emotional play. And that should be done in those times. Someone that has a death in the family, those other things, where you have to console and be sympathetic. Being empathetic or having empathy for a scenario means that you understand what they're saying to you, but it's your job to kind of direct how you land on either side of that line. So there are two different roles to play there, and it becomes a very difficult one at times. Uh, but I think just really understanding and, and uh, uh, kind of bringing that into mind that there's there's time for sympathy, but don't be sympathetic to every cause. That's that's not your job is to be sympathetic. You can be empathetic without being sympathetic. Yeah, the, the great 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 points because you're you're exactly right. You I think the thing is sometimes when you're dealing with difficult people, it doesn't matter what kind of person they are, what category they're f falling into here. It, all they want to do is just let it out sometimes. Maybe they're just, they just want to be able to vent and, and, and so you certainly want to let them be able to have that opportunity and, and show them that you care. That's great. Um, the next scenario is, is a difficult boss and, and, you know, fortunately in my life, I've, I've um, not had to deal with a difficult boss. I don't know. Maybe if my coworkers will um, not necessarily say that now, but um, I, you know, of course, we don't always see eye to eye with our our boss. It doesn't matter whether they're the greatest person in the world or not. And so, um, you know, I think it's important that that we take that listen scenario as, as a part of our um, approach as well. But um, I, I one time. Um, a coworker told me that the best way to deal with a boss is to make them look good. It doesn't matter what you're doing. If you make them look like they're the smartest person in the world, they're going, you're going to get along with your boss. Great. And I think that's always a great, great advice. And so when you're dealing with a scenario where, um, where you have to deal with a boss that may not necessarily be difficult. Um, it may, you may have to bite your tongue a lot, may get awful bloody, but by making them look good, this, your, your, your relationship is going to be even better. Um, just to go through a few of those points, get to know them, including their motivations and stress points. Um, I, I, it's, I, I wear my, my stress on my sleeve. And so a couple, you know, Tuesday this week, I was pretty stressed out and I don't think it was very hard for my coworkers to see that. And so, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure none of them wanted to approach me with any new idea or ask me for something. And I think that that's, that's a good way to understand the per people that you're working with, regardless of whether it's their, you're their boss or not. Um, Support them, work around their weaknesses, know what their weaknesses are. Again, that kind of goes back to making them look good. Um, take the high road, but then at the same time, don't be afraid to speak up when it's when it's a, when it's important. And and one of the things that I always like to to say when I'm speaking to younger folks is I I say don't be afraid to take initiative. Don't be afraid to step up and say. Look, I see. I see that this scenario isn't working very well. I see that we have a problem in our business. Here is what I think we should do. Let's let me. You know, here are my recommendations. You know, I'd be willing to take on this project. Those kinds of things. Um, I really admire um, coworkers who do that and take initiative and don't just sit there with their teeth in their mouth and see a problem and not offer solutions to be able to um, solve the problem. Um, and you know, I think the other thing that um, the next thing on the list is know their know their preferences and adapt. My my scenario here is that um, our my very first boss um, I, when I became the editor, he um, hated reverse type. I mean, he hated it. He never wanted to see reverse type on anything we did, and so I knew. Regardless of what what cover I was putting out, we couldn't put reverse type. There, there was no point in even even trying to attempt that. So you know, know what their preferences are, and make sure that you adapt um, 
accordingly. Um, don't don't be intimidated by a bully of a boss. I mean, you have to stand your ground, but at the same time, try not to be. Um, it's, it's a fine line to walk between being firm, but um, not and difficult yourself. So, um, and then I, the last thing is be proactive when job hunting. You know, if you're getting ready to go on a job hunt, try try to feel out um, whether the boss that you're get, getting ready to go to work for is already is difficult because if they're hard to work for, um, maybe it's not the right fit for you. What else do you have, Cliff, under that scenario? Well, I, I think one of the things that uh, on the management side, you know, when you're trying to build a relationship with your boss and really understand uh, what they're going through at times, and, and believe me, uh, like I, like Holly said, I can be about as difficult probably as anybody in the teams I've managed will tell you that. Uh, but at the same time, I think one of the biggest things, all, and I, I report to somebody as well, so I've got a boss. Mm -hmm. um, the biggest thing to understand is that you aren't the only thing that hangs from their tree. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if you go into a scenario and for some reason they're just having a bad day or things are tough or, or something goes not the way you want it to go, he or she has probably got 15 other things hanging on themselves uh, that day was going to either direct their attention or take their fo focus off you or there's just a lot of things usually that uh, most managers kind of have on their belt and not all of them direct themselves to you and we just got to remember that I got to remember that with my boss and my team has to remember that with me that I'm not myopic with my approach with my thoughts against one thing I got a hundred things in the air as do my teams but that's uh, I think that's a big thing just to remember is that, you know, you're not the only little shining star uh, out there. We've got a whole lot of other things we're trying to do. And the other thing that I think all of us have to remember, and I always like to think of my boss in this role, uh, and Holly kind of referred to it, but it's a little different take. Uh, you know, realistically, I'm in the chair that I'm in, and I've been honestly just blessed and, and privileged to do what I do because of the teams that work with me. Uh, it's, it's not because of me, my abilities, my talents, or anything I've got. It's because I've surrounded myself, and I do have great people that do a great job, uh, and they make my job easier. So I think having that in the back of your head as well, that sometimes managing a difficult boss is being the best you can be, which makes your boss the best they can be, uh, and then that just continues to go right up kind of the ladder, and uh, all of us do better when we're surrounded by good people with good attitudes, but all those things come from the culture within uh, your work. So that's our job as managers is to build a, build a culture that's hopefully supportive and rewarding, those types of things. Uh, but just know that there's a lot of things that most bosses kind of have hanging on their belt. Uh, and also know that the better you can be, usually the better your boss is as well. Okay. The next, um, I think the client is yours, isn't it, Cliff? Yeah, it is, and uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying this is the most difficult, but uh, one of the ways I do like to manage is I always say I, 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 have a, I have an internal management scenario that I have to deal with, and I have an external management uh, that I have to deal with. And realistically, again, uh, it's, it's hard to carry your culture outside to the, those external uh, people that you have to manage. Those, obviously, are your customers and your clients. Uh, I think it's always a good rule to keep to try to bring your your culture if it's a good one in exterior as well, so they understand how and where you're managing from. Uh, but sometimes dealing with clients can be a whole lot tougher than dealing with things internally. Uh, and the biggest reason around that is because you have a different relationship with those internally than you probably do externally. So the biggest thing I think that can come into the client relationship and dealing with difficult clients is. And, and this is just imperative across no matter what chair you fill, is try to build the biggest and best relationship you possibly can with everyone you work with up front. Uh, it's kind of the salesman's homage uh, is to try to know your clients better than anybody else does. If you have a really good, strong client relationship, usually most of these difficult client scenarios, they won't go away because we always have problems. We always have things that happen. But they usually make them a little bit easier to consider and easier to work with. Um, so that's kind of the biggest one. But uh, obviously there's a whole lot of things on a client side that you can come into, uh, and a lot of them deal with the personalities of those folks on the other end of the phone. 
Uh, but you can always get the angry client, that guy that comes in, he's basically never satisfied with anything that happens. Uh, I think we can all point to one or two of those that we either are dealing with or have, and I've got a story for that later. Uh, the impatient client, that, and this is totally different than one of the other bullet points, but it's the guy that calls up, the woman that calls up, and by God, I need something done, I need it done now, and it just has to be done right now. And those are really hard to deal with because, as I said, most of us have a whole bunch of things hanging from our belts. So trying to deal with that timing and the impatience of a client wanting a solution or you've got to run it up the, uh, the ladder to find a solution, or you've got to go to production or, or circulation, or you've got to go to the other side of the agency or to the manufacturing plant to get an answer, it's going to take some time. So those impatient folks are hard to deal with as well. Uh, this is the one that, that I have no time for and is, is I think by far the most difficult scenario uh, to try to manage, and that's an intimidating client. It's the one that usually calls up, and the first thing they do is give you an ultimatum. Either you do this or this happens. And we'll try to talk through some of those when we go through the outline. But I think the intimidating one is the, sometimes the most difficult because you go into the scenario with one of two options. That's never a good way to try to negotiate. Uh, talkative, I've got a little example of this one I'll try to share at the end as well. It doesn't seem like it can be difficult. Uh, but when you're just storming around trying to do things and that client calls that will keep you on the phone literally for 40 to 60 minutes talking about their kid's t-ball game, uh, it, it sometimes is a real difficult scenario. And, and uh, I've, I've got a solution I use on that quite a bit. Uh, demanding kind of goes back to that intimidating one. Those are hard to manage because they come in with a very single-minded solution, and it's usually for them and not for you. And the solutions we're trying to uh, come up with usually are a win-win for both sides. Now, then it's the indecisive one. Uh, even if you do bring a good solution to the table and say, I think this is the best way to try to manage through this thing, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know whether my boss will like it or you know, I just don't know if that uh, – you got to kind of fish or cut bait on those some of those scenarios and just kind of get to the most uh, – either the most obvious or the most conclusive uh, decision that you can. So how do we go about those? Let's go to that next slide, Jen, if you could. Uh, the first thing to always remember is we can't control their behavior, but we can augment or we can try to change their behavior. So going into the scenario, I think the best thing you try to do is to, again, listen. The first thing you've got to do is just continue to listen, listen, listen. Uh, let them have their time. Let them uh, kind of express where they are. But know that really from that other slide, usually you're dealing with, with, with some type of a personality as soon as that phone rings. Uh, this is kind of the old stay calm adage. Uh, you know, the more worked up you get, the more excited you get. If you lose your patience, I guarantee you the person on the other side of the line will do exactly the same thing. Uh, it's kind of like the old scenarios with the, uh, uh, what do they call it, with the traffic things where you get in problems with traffic where you're at a stoplight or something happens and you have an exchange and all of a sudden it just ex escalates and then they jump out of the cars and then it just turns into this great hostile scenario. That thing can happen on a phone or, or trying to be one-on-one -on -one, uh, during a difficult scenario as well. And then don't take it personally. Uh, the scenario probably, sometimes it does, but probably doesn't revolve around you. It revolves around something that happened uh, which you do have control of. So don't try to take it personally. Um, the ask questions kind of goes back to the next point as well, and that really comes back to listening. Understand what the scenario is, hear them out, understand why they're upset and why, uh, what they're bringing to your attention, what it means to their business. So ask questions around that. Um, a lot of times, really, finding a solution can come from the person on the other end of the phone as long as it agrees with something that you can uh, physically manage and or economically or, or whatever managed as a solution. But you know, what can I do to help? What is it that I can do to help you with this scenario? Um, what solution would you have for this? If you try to bring it back to them, number one, you look like the answer guy. So it looks like you want to come to a positive uh, conclusion for this for your client. That ultimately is, is where you want to be. Uh, show them that you care. Really, we go back kind of that emotional uh, sympathy, empathy side. This goes back to being empathetic. Uh, understanding that you care is going to calm them down more than anything you can possibly do. Uh, you know, it, it's you don't person doesn't know how much you care until you show them how much, you know, the old adage. Uh, it couldn't be more true than within these difficult scenarios. Uh, don't ever go into the conversation or don't uh, address the conversation as the blame sits on the company, your company, or sits with the customer. Again, hear it out, understand what's happening, 
kind of be decisive with where it comes down and start to bring your negotiating uh, to a very positive uh, scenario through there. But uh, you are the company and you have to put your, yourself in the shoes of the customer. Uh, so make sure you do not go into the conversation with blame. Uh, you're here to solve a problem, obviously. Uh, that's, that's your role. So the biggest thing that we have to do at the end is to bring a problem or solve a problem. So uh, negotiating always sounds like it's a negative thing, but negotiating can be a very positive thing because it goes back to asking those questions, weighing where you're at, where your client at is at, and how you can bring a solution that's a win for both the client and you or the company. Then the biggest thing, and I tell my sales team this all the time, and I think it resonates through our company, is don't make promises that you can't keep. The adage that we kind of go on is always under-promise and over-deliver. So the more you can under-promise on the solution and then make it better, over-deliver on that promise. But when you start to over-promise and your delivery can't reach where you promised, uh, all you're doing now is creating a different, another difficult scenario that you've got to try to, to get through at the end. So uh, that's, that's kind of a tough thing. One of the biggest things and the thing that probably should have been on the top of this uh, client list is it's our job to go into this with the understanding or the mindset that the client is always right. And I think if we stay calm, we listen, we ask the right questions, uh, we can get to a solution where the client does think that he was right or that he or she has a solution that now uh, kind of cleans up what the difficult, difficult scenario was. So uh, they're not always right, but we've got to try to come to a solution uh, that makes it look like they're right. Holly? Yeah, I, I I don't really have a whole lot to add to that. I think that you you hit it all right on the head. I mean, it's 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 hard. I, I think you're right also that particularly in our business, it, it it and it may not always be a customer. There's times where it may be um, if you're on the editorial side of things, it may be that it's a person that you interviewed that's upset with how the story came out and and you have to handle it. Um, in the best way way possible. So um, I think that um, you know, I, I, to me, those are the, the <coughs> excuse me, the most memorable um, and hardest to deal with ones that I have, I've had to go through. So yep. uh, real quick, we can touch on a few examples here that yeah. Holly and I have, have kind of had in our career. But some of them fall back on this client side and. I do have a client, and he or she, uh, till this day, and I've been both a, a very close friend and a very close uh, yeah. business relationship with them, uh, but it's one of those scenarios, literally, when the phone rings and I answer it, I know damn well that I've got a 40 to 60-minute conversation. Ahead of me. And it always happens on one of those days, and the last thing I have to ever give up is going to be 40 to 60 minutes on a phone call. So my solution to that with this person... Uh, it's usually pretty simple, and I think by now maybe he or she uh, thinks that all I do is sit in meetings all day, which is sometimes the truth. But uh, I'll always answer that phone when it is, and always the first question is, hey, how you doing? And I always say, well, I'm doing great. How you doing? Uh, the only thing is I'm just sitting around waiting for my 1030 conference call, waiting for my you know, 11, 15, what, whatever, and I give it about a 15 to 20 minute increment to the next half hour yeah. on uh, some appointment that I have to be at. Uh, that way it puts kind of a line in the sand. Uh, hey, let's talk. Let's uh, you know continue to catch up and make sure because I truly do love spending time with this person, uh, but I just can't invest the time that sometimes this conversation mm -hmm. takes. So uh, that's one scenario with, again, it's not a difficulty from there's a problem, but it is a difficulty from trying to manage time. Um, and my other one that I'm, I always talk about, which uh, still to this day after 35 years is one of my faves, is this, it is that client that's never happy. Uh, there's always a problem that or what happens. But this particular person, literally, whenever they do business with us, they build a problem. There, there's no problem, but they, they make up a problem, basically. Uh, because at the back end of the whole thing, really, they're trying to get a monetary result from it. So, oh, you know, the, the ad looks really light, or um, you know, we were we were looking to do a different product, and then the I/O said anyway. Oh, there's always a problem with something, and those guys are really, really hard to control. 
uh, those are folks that you kind of go through your repertoire of, of solutions and try to bring a, uh, a solution to the problem. And it's, it's difficult as hell because no matter what you do, their whole intent is to try to get what they want from the back end and say, in this case, it's usually some type of a monetary <coughs> compensation for not doing things right. Uh, so kind of my solution to that, because it, it continues to happen after all the years I've, deal, I've dealt with them, uh, is to continue to go back and just continue to ask questions around what it is until I can almost hopefully stammy them into a corner with where they can't point to whatever it is they're trying to monetize. So, uh, gee, that's funny because I've got, you know, five of my, my press check copies in front of me and there's no variation whatsoever to the color of the ad. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, mine is, well, you know, we print 250,000 issues of right. Drovers a month. And there are variations to the press when it's coming back up or something. Every once in a while, an issue will slip out of our QC. I'm afraid maybe you got one of those, but I can assure you that the rest of the run was fine. So, you, you, you again, you try to bring it to a conclusion that kind of backs them in the corner where it doesn't happen until the one time where this client literally called me and said he wanted me to make a personal donation to his son's or daughter's uh, 4-H project, and that was that was kind of, <laughs> kind of the end of it, where I uh, maybe overstepped my bounds a little bit, but kind of came back and said, you know, look, there's there's different lines in the sand here from a business relationship or what would be a personal relationship, and I'm afraid you just overstepped that here because that's not my role. So sometimes you do have to um, kind of put that uh, – um, I don't know what you want to call it, but that, that no-nonsense hat on and put your foot down to say, look, I have a job to do. These are the boundaries of what I can and can't do, and I'm afraid we've just crossed them here, so we're going to have to take that conversation at another time or, or in another scenario. So uh, we've all got them. We've all had them. We're all going to continue to get them. Uh, but, again, I think the more that you can uh, try to follow some of these steps and, and really make this a process and, and continue to think, through the conversation, how you can bring a solution forward a little better. Uh, Holly, how about you on some Yeah, examples? and I, I think maybe that addresses uh, Diane's question about is it okay to, when is it okay to fire a client? I think that there are some boundaries, and, and I have an example as well where, um, you know, established a, a, a project with a client and um, they were okay with it all the way through the project until um, it was published, and then after it was published, then they uh, were um, questioning the integrity of our, our, you know, our staff, questioning um, the quality of the product. And, and, you know, at some point when they start to cross the line into, you know, personal attack or personal um, – you know, where, where you feel uncomfortable, I think it's okay to say, we don't need to do business with you anymore. And, and you know, I appreciate the relationship up until this point, but, um, you know, you're obviously not happy and, uh, you know, we feel like we've done whatever we can do. And um, so, you know, if you want to take your business elsewhere, that's fine. And, and I, think, I think it's okay because there are times where, you know, your personal stress level just isn't, isn't worth, worth doing that. And if, particularly if you're a freelancer, I know that that's probably a hard line to, to draw on this sand to say, you know, I, I'm going to go elsewhere and try to find another client. So. Yeah, and I think really it comes back, like Holly said, to that boundary line. Uh, and I think you use that both internally and externally as well. Uh, sometimes I do like to compare things back, to, like my internal scenarios, to say, look, I've got to handle this scenario the way I would handle any other scenario with any other employee, teammate, whatever the scenario might be. And I think you can do the same thing externally. You know, sure. come to a client and say, look, I've got to put you on the same platform stage boundaries, whatever, as I do all the other clients that I work with. And unfortunately, you know, my other clients are here, and you come and, kind of come to the other side of that boundary line, whether yeah. it's, you know, you don't spend with us where I can truly afford you as a client anymore, or some of the rationale or expectations um, we just literally cannot commit to. And, you know, the way that we do business is if we can't do things and do it right, we really don't want to do them at all. So I think you it's, it's a lot of times it's helpful to compare them with other people or other 
clients that you have to kind of give them that sense that there is this uh, this kind of acceptance level and there's there's a non-acceptance level. And usually if people or clients can see where, where they're stepping over the bounds, which other people can accommodate, I think that makes that discussion go a little bit easier, a little bit better. Sure. Um, Miranda asks, how do you handle teammates who take too much ownership in a project, taking credit for other people's ideas, getting upset when the team makes changes, et cetera? Um, you know, I, I mean, I, I guess that's a good problem to have, the fact that they, they are so vested in, in the project that they, they um, you know, take that much ownership in it. But, um, you know, I think maybe it's whoever the team leaders, I, um, whoever, you know, is in charge of the project, I, I think there's times where you can say to someone when they say, well, that was my idea, it's okay for them to say, you know, hey, we're working together here. Um, everybody's ideas are important. Um, you know, there's a couple of pushbacks that you can give them as you go along. Um, I understand that that you believe that, that um, we shouldn't, that that isn't the change that we should make, but because of da 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 da, da you know, I feel like it's that we have to do that. And <clears throat> I um, I think it's always important to maybe take a, have, assign someone as a lead on a project um, and as a, as a boss. So there's times that you know that you can't assign certain people as a lead. Um, but if there's a lead on a project and then it's that person's job to maybe do some of that pushback, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but. Yeah, I think some of the times or ways that I've handled this in the past when either an email goes out or there's some conclusion drawn to where someone does try to take uh, either some unearned credit or doesn't give the rest of the team or uh, credit and those types of things, I always try to respond, whether it's to the email or the person, whatever else, to say, you know, like, hey, Miranda, certainly understand exactly what you brought to the cause, and I'll tell you what you did behind this was exemplary. You know, you, you, the job you did at, uh, you know, building this list was really, really well done. Uh, but we've also got to give credit to Holly and to Jennifer uh, for doing this, 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 and this. Uh, so we kind of do, I think we do two things. Number one, uh, we show that there was responsibility and there was success through the team. Uh, but I think the other thing it kind of does is temper or bring the other person kind of down a little bit, if you will, uh, to the point to where, you know, they, they kind of get the understanding, maybe a little slap on the wrist that, uh, you know, there, there were a whole lot of other people involved in this and they all worked as hard as I did. But, uh, you know, it's, I think it's one of those points where, uh, uh, you know, th th those people are probably going to carry that behavior forward. So anything we can do to consistently go back and consistently show them that, uh, teams are built for those reasons. We try to take the disciplines of those folks that are, uh, you know, have disciplines in different areas, bring them together, and then the results should be a lot better than it is a singular person's sure. uh, trying to attempt the same cause. So uh, it's a team a team effort. Any other questions out there? Uh, as I said, we gave you guys a lot of times at the back end to try to uh, see if you can stump Holly <laughs> and myself. Uh, you know, one thing I think that's uh, – as, as a manager, and I think we have to have this a lot of times, and it kind of goes back to that, uh, making sure that you've got that line drawn in the sand, that everybody does kind of know the rules. And I, I'm not a rules guy. I don't like to have a, a real strict environment. That's not the culture I like to work in, so I don't think folks uh, that are on my team like to work like that either. But you do have to have parameters. Otherwise, it's like having a kindergarten where everybody's running around, and, and it's just crazy as hell. Uh, so, so, uh, you know, one of the things kind of against that is, uh, I had a couple of times employees to where they just start taking advantage of something. One of those parameters, they start taking advantage of one thing that I remember a lot that uh, has happened on a few occasions is kind of the time off button. So all of a sudden you're in your office and one of your reports comes in and says, Hey, uh, you know, my, uh, I'm sick. I got to go home. Okay, fine. Or they call you in the morning and I ah, don't feel well. I'm staying home today, and that just becomes habitual, and then it starts to grow. Now my kid is sick, and then my husband is sick, so I've got to stay home with them. Or it's uh, I've got a relative that died, and all of a sudden they've got 
33 relatives that die in a year and you're trying to chase you know that around or i've got car trouble and how many cars do you own you could possibly have that many car troubles in a month unless you have a set of cars and it just gets to be this repetitive thing of uh, the time off so you know that's something that you got to pull forward on your own and say uh look you know we've got a problem here and we've got a scenario where we've got to control our our personal time against our business time you aren't doing a real good job of it right now uh, you know i'm i'm just dependent on your time here as your family or whatever else is dependent on your time there and you know i'm not i'm gonna do my best to not ask for your family time but you can't starve me of our company time either so and again i always compare it back you know i've got to carry i've got to i've got to hold you the same parameters that i hold the rest of the team and again if you bring something back i think to where you say you cross the line, you're doing things that culturally or, or through a team perspective where you're not carrying your water, uh, that becomes a real, I think, a real hard line to where they, they kind of get the idea that either either I, I kind of go back and accommodate to what the team expects or I'm going to be an outlier. And good things usually don't happen to outliers. So, uh, I, And that sort of answers, Miranda, the second question, how do you keep people on track without um, – seeming like a drill sergeant, I think um, I think that one thing that I, I a piece of advice is if you're if you're someone's supervisor, it's okay sometimes to be a little fed up with them. I mean, and it's okay sometimes to see that they that to let them see that you're not happy. And I mean, of course, all of us want to be liked and we want to be um accepted and 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 but i at the same time i think it's okay to say look i'm i'm fed up you've missed your deadline again do not let it happen again and and i think it's okay to see let them see that because um you know they they have to know that that you do have your line in the sand yeah part of the way that i i hope and i hope none of my teammates are on here because uh, they might end up asking a question or saying something that could dismay that or displace this. But uh, I think one of the best way to manage, first of all, if you're not hiring the best people that you think will fit your culture, you're not doing a good job of hiring. And you got to do a good job of hiring to build good teams because now you've got people that are kind of succinct in plus the way you manage, which I think is, is again, I think is a very important thing. But one of the ways I try to manage is I give everyone on my staffs, uh, I think a pretty long leash. I hire them because they're good. I hire them because they're competent. I don't have the time to babysit or be a drill sergeant or be constantly on them as a kind of a hovering boss. I just, I don't have the time to do it. So I, I think giving people a large rope uh, allows them to expand their wings and do things, make decisions on their own. Uh, but I also think then that when I do kind of come down on something or someone, uh, they know that it's kind of a pretty big deal. Because I've got, a, I think, a pretty strong tolerance and temper uh, that I, I really let folks manage themselves. But if I've got to come in and if I have to put my foot down, uh, it's kind of the way I was raised as a kid with my dad. Uh, my dad was a fabulous dad. He gave us all a lot of rope. But if he came into that room and he had that look on his face, I, I knew that there was something I had to accommodate and accommodate quick, and it better not happen again. And that's really the, the way I try to manage. Um, everybody's going to make mistakes. I make mistakes, believe me, all the time. Th those aren't what I think we're talking about here and even what Miranda's uh, question was. The, the real thing becomes uh, when it becomes habitual or, or when it's something to where you know, they're either getting lazy or it just isn't happening. That, that's where I come in. And kind of put my foot down and, and again I, I think if you manage that way if, you, if you're on them all the time you're just whipping them whipping them whipping them whipping them it's like the boy that cried wolf all of a sudden you don't really realize are you doing something right are you doing it wrong what do we got to do to please you and, uh, and i think and, and i think cliff the clear clear guidelines that we said you know in evaluation or um you know making it putting it down on paper i think also helps so yep, yep, absolutely absolutely yeah. Yeah. what else folks Still got 10 minutes. Holly yeah. still got her voice. Well, actually, Cliff, I kind of promised them I, I quit at 1045. Oh, but, really? Oh. 
Yes. No, you're good. You're good. It's a good conversation. And so you'll, I think you guys might notice a few people dropping off because we typically wrap up at 1045 so they can get to their next meeting. But we did just get one more question in. So if you guys are game for one more, um, we can keep it going if you guys have time, Cliff and Holly. Sure. Okay. How do you, Danielle. Hi, Danielle. Um, how do you manage time off for your employee kids' activities? Um, at High Plains Journal, we're, we're very flexible. I, I think that um, one of the things that one of the benefits we can offer our employees is to, um, is to allow them that flex time. And, you know, I, and, and I think that that's sort of addressed, it's kind of addressed at what, what Cliff said. You know, some people can, can come to the point where they abuse it. And I think you just have to say, um, recognize when you get to that point and be able to say, you know, we're, we're, we're flexible, but, um, you know, I, I recognize that you're taking an awful lot of time away from the office for this. Tell me how you're you're going to make that time up appropriately so that so that it doesn't become a problem. You're not pushing more work off onto your your coworkers. And I think sometimes when you put it into that perspective, that you know when they say, "Oh, I'm taking off every, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday at noon," and that means somebody else has to do more work, then you ask them how you how you make it up to the coworker that has has the work shoved on them. That that sometimes helps as well. No, absolutely good. It all comes down to culture. Holly's absolutely right. Uh, it's when it becomes habitual that you have a problem. Uh, but I think the, uh, again, the answer around that, most, most of our folks, and again, I hope that we hire as a team, that you hire like-minded folks. Uh, but these guys are working nights. They're working weekends. They do everything it takes to get the job done. So if they want to take time off to be with family or have kids game, we're all for right. it, as, again, as long as it's, uh, it doesn't get a, create a problem for somebody else. So. Thanks everybody for your time. Yeah, Appreciate thank it. you everybody. It, and I, I, you're more than welcome to email either one of us. I'm sure. Um, I, or I guess I shouldn't speak for Cliff, but you know, if you have additional questions or anything that um, that you didn't get a chance to ask or didn't want to ask in front of everyone, be sure and send us an email. We'd be happy to help and advise you however we can. Absolutely, be more than happy to do it. Have a great day, everybody. Thanks for yes. your time. Thanks, guys. We appreciate thank it. Mm -hmm.